and we are ready to rock and roll. Here we are. And then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all, the, all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Genesis chapter, I don't know, 3, 4, something like that. It's chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verses, what, 14 and 15? Seems about right. Okay. This looks familiar. Okay. We left off here last week. And um, I promise you that we come back and do this a little bit uh, more thoroughly. I've, I've gone through the material. I've uh, kind of thinned it down so that you can see the forest and not just be lost in the trees. And um, however, uh, I want to make this point once again that uh, in our verse, Ezekiel 28, 15, we have the, the clause, until unrighteousness was found in you. And this word for unrighteousness is a, a word which uh, means iniquity. Uh, and I want to show you how the word iniquity and unrighteousness are actually synonymous not only in thought but in every other way. And uh, as uh, the point uh, says on the screen, we can make three major categorizations in the area of hermartiology. Hermartiology is the study of sin. It's one of the uh, many major segments in theology, and um, I don't think that I've actually made a big stab at uh, this particular doctrine in church or in any of the classes. So hopefully this will uh, give a little breath of fresh air as we go into new territory. These divisions accommodate our English language. Therefore, we use three English words. Iniquity, transgression, and sin are synonymous of the idea of committing a wrong, but they have different shades of meaning when studied from the Hebrew language. Okay. Iniquity was found in you. And uh, when we talk about iniquity and we talk about unrighteousness, we're talking about a divergence from God's policy. This whole idea of a divergence is the same idea as propounding a lie. God, at the very beginning, set down what his verse was, or what his universe was supposed to be. Down the line, one of his creatures, we know him as Lucifer uh, today, that's the name or the nickname that we've given him to him, he came up with a divergent idea. As a result, now we have a multiverse, or we have a diverse, we have differences as to the version of the way things are. So, this tends to be the major hallmark for Satan. And that is that Satan will always give you a different idea than God's. He says, you know what God said, but let me put it to you this way. We see it as early as uh, the woman in the garden when conversing with the serpent. The serpent says, has God said? It's merely a question, but the question is uh, implying that what God had said is not the truth. And he only says what he says because he has the power to say it, not because it is the truth. And we find that the, the basic hallmark or the basic 
method, strategy that Satan uses is always to take the truth and to prevaricate it or to, to tweak it, to twist it, so it doesn't say what it's supposed to say. And so the, gospel, the New Testament tells us that Satan has blinded the mind of the unbeliever. What does that mean? It means that the unbeliever can't get at the truth because in the method that Satan works, he has clouded the facts so that the unbeliever cannot put the facts together so as to believe the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ said that he is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Liar and a murderer. What does liar mean? It means that he is not sticking to the truth. And so when we come to this particular idea of diverging from God's policy, God said, you're a created creature, your job is this, and he said, I would like to do this, and I would like to do this, and we have five I wills. Each of these I wills diverts the truth, and it has been promulgated to a certain number of angels or a certain percentage of angels. We don't know how many angels there really are, and as a result, we see that this is brought up in Ezekiel 28. So, what does this mean to you and to me as a person? What it means to you and to me as a person is that Satan or Lucifer is a thousand times smarter than I am, and he can twist the words just right to fool me. And you say, yeah, but, you know, I'm, I'm not... I wasn't born yesterday. I, I, I know more than that. And it's true you weren't born yesterday. The trouble is, is that you don't have the complete facts. The complete facts are found in the scripture, and I dare say you don't know the scriptures as well as you should. And when you do get to know them as well as you should, there are some things that God has left out. And he says to you, trust me and that becomes the rub am i going to believe god or am i going to believe this guy so iniquity is that divergence all right oh i should have brought my book uh, girdleson's book synonyms of the old testament and he writes this, The pictorial power of the Hebrew language is seldom exhibited more clearly than in connection with the various aspects of evil. Every word is a piece of philosophy, nay, it's a revelation. The observer of human affairs is painfully struck by the wearisomeness of the wearisome of this life and by the amount of toil and travail which the children of men have to undergo to obtain a bare existence. He sees the hollowness, the vanity, and unreality of much that seems bright and charming at first. He notes that human nature and its personal and social aspects is distorted and out of course, that the chain of love which ought to bind the great family and one uh, has been snapped asunder. That isolation and desolation have taken the place of unity and happiness that the relationship between man and his maker has, be, uh, has become obscured, and that even when man knows the will of God, there is something in his nature which prompts him to rebel against it. Lastly, he comes to the conviction that this state of things is not original, but is opposed to men's best best instincts and frustrates the original design of their creation. The Hebrew Bible meets us with a full acknowledgement of these manifold aspects of human suffering and blends wrongdoing and suffering to a remarkable degree. Setting forth sin and its relationship to God, to society, and to man's own self, 
depicting it in its negative aspect as iniquity or unrighteousness. I've got it in the green uh, print, so you can see iniquity and unrighteousness, they are the twins there. Positive aspect as rebellion and breach of trust. Rebellion and breach of trust. Breach of trust, of course, is betrayal. <clears throat> when Lucifer fell morally, he had the negative aspect of unrighteousness and the positive aspect of rebellion. He took erring steps from his duty and from what was right. So let me begin with the three words that we have looked at um, that deal with wrongdoing. The first of these words is transgression. This is not the word in our text in, in Ezekiel 28 and verse uh, 15. This word is not in there, but we put it up on the screen so that we can contrast it. The word is avar, or chavar. Not a hard at the beginning, but hard enough so that you can hear it. Chavar. And this particular word means to go beyond a moral or spiritual limitation. It is somebody who is crossing the line. So transgression means that you are going across. Another word that has been used in connection with transgression is the word trespass. For instance, if you get caught shoplifting, particularly at Walmart, they will have you prosecuted and part of the prosecutorial sentence is going to be that you are going to be trespassed off of all Walmarts for a period of a year or so. If they catch you within the store, you have transgressed because you have crossed the line. You know, the automatic doors have opened and they open for everybody else, but not for you. That is this word. It means that you're not supposed to go in there, but you have. That's transgression. You are not supposed to cross that line, but you have. There's a red light at the corner. You're supposed to stop. And when I was a kid, I thought it was great fun just to whip right through it because it gives everybody a lift, doesn't it? There is a passage of scripture, Joshua 23 and verse 16, which gives us an idea of what transgression is. And uh, just uh, to look at it, let's uh, turn to that passage. Would you open your Bibles to Joshua 23, 16? Or, I think I may have the wrong citation. Let's see. Okay, there it is. Verse 16. When you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you will perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. Here you have the word uh, transgress, and uh, the idea here is not geographical so much. It is spiritual. When you cross the line and start serving other gods, then God is going to send anger, uh, his wrath against you. Okay. Let's transport ourselves all the way back into the time of the Apostle Paul. There's a church in a very um, sinful place called Corinth. And in Corinth, everybody has their own particular god. Some worship Osiris, some worship uh, Apollo, some worship somebody else. There's just, there's a god for everybody. But the people there, they're kind of like in San Francisco. Not only are they weird, 
but they like good food. They're foodies. And they know that the best meat always comes from a sacrifice. So a sacrifice is brought to uh, one of these heathen temples and the priest keeps them and then the rest they, s they sell to the merchants that are just outside the temple that are selling cuts of beef or cuts of goat or cuts of whatever meat that it is. So you're a Christian and you buy some of this meat. Is that a sin? No. And the Apostle Paul says no. Why? Because you know that an idol is nothing. Right? Can you make that into a sin? Yes. How could you do that? It's By doing it in front of somebody who thinks it's a sin. Okay, that, that would be part of it. Is there another way? Uh, to, um, uh, if we're talking about meat here or any other food, when you ingest it and you have sinful thoughts. Okay, that's another way. Any others? Just boasting that it's a worship. Sacrifice. Yeah, okay. Let's put ourselves before you buy the meat. Okay. Suppose you go into the temple and you bow down yeah. to the idol. Oh. And then you buy the meat. Right. Because in your mind you're saying, this meat was offered to this idol. It's going to be better for me. Yeah. Oh, today we could say it's non-GMO or whatever you want to call it and it's better for me now that's sinful okay. you have transgressed right because you've come down to bow down to these idols okay so this word here tells us that it's not so much crossing a geographical line it's crossing a spiritual line you know you're not supposed to worship these idols they do not supply you with salvation. They do not supply you with the logistical grace, food, shelter, and clothing. I do that. So when you, when you migrate over to that side, you've crossed the line. That's transgression. When the Bible says, Thou shalt not steal. So, I'm looking over at Melissa's phone. Uh, I know that she got it at T-Mobile. And I'm saying, boy, that's a pretty nice phone there. Well, I'm not going to steal it. But am I coveting it? Yes. See, now I've trans I, I've migrated. I've transgressed. Because even though I'm not actually taking it from her in my mind, just like the Apostle Paul says, I would know Thou shalt not covet unless the law told me. And that is what this word means. It's wrongdoing. It can mean the physical, absolutely. But more importantly, it talks about the mental. It talks about that part that you can't see. And that's the part that Satan works on. Because he will tell you, it may be a sin, but the consequences are worth it. <laughs> I mean, hasn't that happened? Of course it happens all the time. Oh, yeah. So, Joshua 23 and verse 16. The next verse is the word kata. The C-H at the beginning is kind of like the C-H at Christmas, or for the spelling of Christmas. Kata. And this is another word that's not in our text. Kata, C-H-A-T-A-H, kata. And this word means to miss the mark. It's very much like the Greek. It means to miss the mark. So on the left, you have a picture of somebody who's swinging a sling, and he's going to aim. And uh, there's the target. You can see that he's a little off-center. So he has missed the mark. Now, in Hebrew writings, sin, as kata, is not usually regarded as a condition, that is, sinfulness. 
but it is regarded as a definite act. But that act can be a, a mental act, can be a verbal act, or it can be an overt act. So, whereas the other one, the one that we just looked at, meant the crossing of the line, here you have not doing what you're supposed to do. So, what is the greatest of all the commandments? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. Have you done that? You say, well, I have. I've consciously loved the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my strength, with all my soul, with all my mind. Except for last Tuesday. <laughs> you just flunked. See? And that's missing the mark. I didn't do it when I was sleeping because I was unconscious. You just missed the mark. No excuses are accepted. You missed the mark. It doesn't say with half your heart, with half your soul. It says with all of it. And so this is what missing the mark is. And once again, Satan is in there because he wants to work your mind over so that somehow you will excuse sin. And you will say, I'm worthy because I have done everything. And then what that does is that takes grace and puts it off to the side. It is no longer applicable to you. You don't want grace because you don't deserve grace. You deserve what you deserve. Isn't that basically what he was saying in eternity past? Look at me, I'm so great. Hey, everybody in heaven, turn around and look at me. See, now this is very, very cool because when we come to Ezekiel 28 and we look at the sentence, that you know, that <clears throat> the decree and sentence, the judgment and sentence that God imposes upon, upon Satan, time and time again it says, and everybody will see you, and everybody will see you, and everybody will see you for what you really are. And I'll tell you what, that hurts a person who is self-involved, self-deceived, and that's what he was, and he wants to do the same thing to you. Okay, let me move on. It also means to make a false step. Therefore, it means to err from the path of duty or to err from what is right. And I gave you the example of Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Mm. Two passages of Scripture, Proverbs 19.2 and Proverbs 20 in verse 2. Mm. Pardon me. Would you turn your Bibles to uh, Proverbs 19 and verse 2? There are a lot of things in the context of this particular proverb. And so as not to get bogged down in it, let's just read verse 2, and this is what it says. Also, it is not good for a person to be without knowledge. And he who hurries his footsteps err. Okay, so verse 2 just simply says, it's not a virtue to be ignorant. So you get the chance to get educated, get educated. There are some particular Christian groups that don't believe that. They believe that it's okay for men to be educated, but women are strictly for breeding purposes. Their job is to have babies, and so you get them to the age of puberty once they are beginning to uh, once they're beginning to have their fallopian tubes lay eggs, marry them off. They don't need to go to high school. They don't need to go to college. All they are is breeders. This passage here teaches otherwise. And it's important for 
you to understand that. And then the second part of uh, verse 2 says, And the person who hurries his steps, or his step, errs. And uh, the idea is that when you do things in a hurry, you're not paying attention, you are going to err. So not only is it important for you to be educated, but it's important for you to be diligent in doing what it is that you're going to be doing. In other words, to be careful in what you're doing. So um, that's look across the page to, to uh, um, Proverbs uh, 20 and uh, verse 2. The terror of a king is like the growling of a lion. He who provokes him to anger, and then you see that word forfeits. I don't know if you have that in your Bibles or not. Um, has anybody got the King James? What word does it use there? Verse 2 of, of Proverbs 20. The fear of the king is as the roar of a lion, who so, who so provoketh him to anger, sinneth against his own soul. Sinneth against his own soul. That's this word here. See? And what it means is, if you start a fight with the lion, you're going to lose. See? And you have erred from the path of what is right. Any fool knows you don't start a fight with a lion. You sin against your own soul. <clears throat> now we come to our word. The word is iniquity. And uh, this is the word that is in our text. And this is the Hebrew word aval. And I know I told you sometime in the past that there is a letter in this word, and I'll put my uh, cursor over the top of it. It is this little, um, it's got like a hat on top and a straight line that comes down. It's called the WAW, W-A-W. But if you learned your Hebrew from a German professor, it's called the VAV, V-A-V. And most of the people in the world pronounce it as Vav. Only in America, and that's because a lot of our uh, teachers were from Texas, or they were Southern Baptist, and they just could not wrap their minds around that V in there. And uh, But for our purposes, we will pronounce that Vav as a V. And so it would be Aval, Aval, and that is the word for iniquity. <clears throat> iniquity is the lack of integrity and rectitude. Rectitude apparently is its accompaniment. So when you have integrity, you're going to have rectitude. The two of them go together. It is probably the essential part of avoiding wrongdoing. And what is rectitude? Rectitude is that you won't quit until it's right. You are going to do this so that it's right. Now, I have worked in a lot of places, and one of the uh, sayings that uh, is popular amongst the laborers is, it's good enough for government work. And it's true that there's a certain margin with which you have to work because your employer will say, you know, if it's here, it's okay. If it goes beyond that, then it's not okay. And so rectitude means that if you are supposed to be measuring, let's say you work at uh, one of these textile stores, what is it? Um, fabric shop and they say I want two yards they've got the measurements right there on the counter so that they can just run their scissors right along that little trough and you got yourself a yard or two yards or however many yards it is that you want of that particular bolt of cloth 
that track that you run your scissors through is the rectitude. See? And so a lack of integrity is when you don't care. But when you do care and you have the rectitude, then you have the essential part of avoiding wrongdoing. Now I've got an image on the screen with three places in which uh, a house has not been um, constructed or founded correctly. In the leftmost image, you see a house, and uh, behind the house you can see that there is a straight line that goes, it's kind of like at the bottom of the windows, and it goes on either side of the house, and that's the, the baseline. That's your rectitude. And because somebody did not do their whole homework or didn't do it right, they built this house on soft soil so that as the years went by, that house sunk and sunk and sunk. Because the soil or the softness of the soil was pretty well standard, then it sank or the house sank in a uniform manner. And so it's not so noticeable until you can't open the door because, you know, you've sunk below the door. In the second one, uh, that is the image in the middle, you have a house that is slightly tipping. And that is because the underlayment or the under um, the soil that is under the house and under the foundation has a gradual softness. It's hard on one side, but it's soft on the other. And so the house sinks and it tips over a little bit, but the, the softness is not so drastic so that it drops a lot at the one end of the house. So that all that the house does is that it just tips and it sinks that way. Lack of rectitude. In the third one, you have a house and the soil was so uneven that the soil on let's see, be the right side of the house sank much faster and the house was not able to take that stress and it cracked and broke. And so this happens lots up here in the Pacific Northwest because we are built on, well, a number of things, but basically sand and uh, some uh, uh, lava uh, or volcanic ash that has formed our soil along with pine needles. And so our soil is kind of soft. In the 1800s, they started putting in a whole bunch of mills and the mills would make mountains of sawdust. So what did they do? They just took a caterpillar and they smoothed out these mountains and then pretty soon people built houses on top of the sawdust. Well, the sawdust starts to rot and the ground starts to sink and houses will have cracks in them. Doesn't help that every once in a while we have an earthquake. And that's when the soil underneath kind of liquefies and the weaker soil drops, the stronger soil stays up, and houses have damages. The same thing happens in your life. If you don't build your life upon solid rock, you may tip a little bit, or you may go down evenly so that people don't notice, but you are sinking. And it is important that you do not sink. Because in the eyes of the angelic world, you are lacking integrity. Integrity becomes one of those select words which go to describe spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity means that on the inside, you are tough, you are strong, you are 
that sub uh, soil, that underlayment that goes underneath the house, and that house is going to be stable and it's not going to sink. On the outside, you are very vulnerable. You're made out of flesh and blood, and somebody may come and shoot you, and you'll suffer and probably even die. But the inside is hard. That's spiritual maturity. And so spiritual maturity is integrity. Now, I'd like for you to turn your Bible, since we're in Proverbs, just go a few pages over to Proverbs 28. Verse 6. This is what it says. Proverbs 28 and verse 6. Better is the poor, you could add the word person, better is the poor person who walks in his or her integrity than the person who is crooked even though he or she is rich. So the Bible tells us that your earthly belongings, the earthly chattel which you might uh, accrue to yourself, that curtilage that you might take to yourself, that means nothing compared to the integrity of your soul. And this is one of the reasons that the Bible says, what does it profit a man if he wins or earns, collects the whole world, but loses his own soul? So where and how are you going to build your life? You have to build it on a rock. And, and that rock is Jesus Christ. That reminds me of a song I used to sing when I was a kid in the Mormon church. It was called uh, The Foolish and Wise Man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the foolish man built his house upon the sand, and we would go like this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with the hands. But anyway, foolish man built his hand, uh, house upon the sand, and it was washed away. Um, the wise man built his house upon the rock that is Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and that stood all withstood all that mother nature could throw at it mm -hmm. and the big bag wolf came and he said I'll huff Love and I'll puff and so I'll yeah okay number two this word in some of its forms reminds us of the word evil. The, the German word is the word Ubel. I had to listen to how they pronounce it, and so I got on the internet. They pronounce it Ube. And of the contracted word ill. And uh, we made some remark last uh, week about an ill conceived plan, ill advice. Um, ill whatever and what that just means is a contracted form of evil it is not all there when I'm sick and I feel ill it's because I'm not totally there I'm not a hundred percent it is in reference to a secret sin a secret sin I think it was Freddie Fender who sang, you know, now I sing it from the highest hill, even tell the golden daffodil. You guys know that song? Well, <coughs> okay. <laughs> Number four. A wrong that has not come out to the open, but it is still sin. So this is when the person hasn't gotten caught, but it's still sin. I'm reminded of the old joke about the preacher who was preaching about the Ten Commandments. <laughs> have you guys heard that joke? I, I have not, but it sounds funny. <laughs> okay. And uh, he was going through, you know, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal... 
And uh, when it came to Thou Shalt Not Steal, somebody had stolen his bicycle. <laughs> then he got to the next one, Thou Shalt Not Commit Adultery, and he remembered where he left it. Oh. <laughs> okay, this is a wrong that has not come out to the open. It is still sin. Even though nobody else will recognize it as sin, it is still sin. Generally speaking, this is a mental attitude. And we find it in our passage of Scripture, Ezekiel 28, verses 15 and verse 18. And they speak of the mental attitude that Satan had, or Lucifer had before his fall. And last week we read Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, the mental attitude of the priest. So just for now, let's go over to Ezekiel 28, so that we can... Um, uh, see the way this word is used in our passage. Ezekiel 28, verse 15. And verse 15 says, You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. And once again, this is a secret sin. This is a mental attitude sin. And he was created perfect. And this verse tells us he started out okay, but he didn't end that way. Then verse 18, jump down uh, to the 18th verse. By the multitude of your iniquities, that is the multitude of these particular un- uh, known sins, the secret sins, and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profane your sanctuaries, therefore I have brought fire from the midst of you, it has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. And I just want to remind you that the Lord kind of brings that up time and again, in the eyes of all who see you. Okay, Psalm 92 and verse 15. Would you turn your Bibles to Psalm 92, please? This is a very beautiful psalm. It's called the Sabbath Psalm because this is a psalm that was touched on, preached on for many, many Sabbaths all across uh, the Jewish world. And um, it uh, really is a great psalm. Uh, one of the uh, parts that I uh, like uh, the most is where it talks about the people who gather uh, to hear the Word of God and how they are uh, pictured, the imagery of them is that they're like palm trees in the courts of the Lord. And uh, these palm trees receive moisture, receive nutrients from uh, the house of God, and they are able to grow straight and tall, produce fruit, and they produce shade for anybody who wants to relax underneath them. And it's a beautiful picture of a believer who takes in the Word of God. That's Psalm 92. Psalm 92 finishes off with, um, well, let me, let me read to you verse 12. That was the verse I was referring to a minute ago. The righteous man will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap. And, ev and very green. And I like this because even when you're old and people says, say, you're no good to society anymore, according to God's word, that is not so. And maybe it, it, old age hasn't touched you. But trust me, it touches soft at the beginning. And as you get older, it hits you harder and harder. Well, anyway, um, 
verse 14 says, They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. And now we come to our verse, verse 15. For the purpose of, or with the result, that they will declare that the Lord is upright. Now check this out. See, you get old, and you are able to say, I have been alive for 80 years or 70 years, and God has never let me down. That's a testimony. I have depended on God, and even though I failed Him, He has always been faithful and true to me. That is declaring that the Lord is upright. Next line. He is my rock. The Hebrew word for rock is the word sewer. It's kind of like the word sewer, you know, like sewage, except that it starts with a T. Sewer. And there is no unrighteousness in him. There is no, and here is that word that we were lo looking at. Except this word is a little bit different. It has what is known as a dogish forte. And let me point it out to you with my cursor. Here is that Hebrew letter. It looks like a hat with a stick coming down. But in the bosom of the letter, there is this dot. It's called the dogish. And the dogish doubles the letter. And when it doubles the letter, it makes the action more intense than it was originally. So, and there is no unrighteousness, is the way that it should be said, because this is very intensive. The Lord is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness. What was found in Satan? Unrighteousness. unrighteousness. What was not found in our Lord Jesus Christ? that unrighteousness and what's more it's very intensive here so you may want to keep your finger here or not i mean it's a very simple verse here but let me take it to another passage of scripture it's psalm 118 verses 22 to 24 and this is what it says the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this is the historical happiness or happiness, happy, happenstance that took place. And that is that when they were building the temple, there was the stone and the builders didn't know what to do with it. So they said, this must, somebody must not have cut this stone right. So they kicked it over the cliff or over the embankment there that didn't break. It turns out that that was the chief cornerstone. That is the picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They put him on the cross, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the exousia power, to become the sons of God. And that's where you and I are. He was rejected by many, but he is our chief cornerstone. And that's why he is my rock. See? The next verse, verse 23, says, This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. In other words, there's not a dang thing that we can do about it. It was in the plan of God that our Lord Jesus Christ should come and that he was rejected by men, but some have accepted him, and it is marvelous in our eyes that he thought enough of you and me to send his son. This is the day which the Lord has made. What day are they talking about? Sabbath day. What does Sabbath mean? No work. What does that mean for you and for me? You don't work for salvation. You accept the gift of God and His Son. See, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, Psalm 118, verses 22 to 24. There are various words for rock or stone in Hebrew. 
One of them is the word Evan. So if you know somebody with, who's got that name, Evan or Evan, you know it means stone. It's the same as Peter, same as Cephas, but this is the Hebrew version, Evan. But two of all of the words that are used for rock or stone in the Hebrew language are of special interest as to us, especially when we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those two words are sur and selah. Sur and selah. Sur. This word means rock, rocky wall, cliff, rocky hill, mountain, rocky surface, or even a boulder. This is Christ in crucifixion. He was crucified on a rock. The rock had the image of a skull, so it was called Golgotha, or Calvary for us. So Tsur is the rock of Calvary. That's the rock where Christ is crucified. Selach. This is from an unused uh, word, and it means a lofty crag or a cliff. Now, unless you've been hiking, you probably can't tell the difference between the side of a mountain and a crag. But a crag is like way up high, and it kind of hangs over, and... Uh, and it's dizzying to look at it. And that's the way that this was. This is Christ in resurrection. Two very special words. Now, I already took that image down. But in Psalm 92.15, which word was used? Can you remember? Do I got to go back? He is my sutsur. And what's that mean? He is the one who went to the cross for me. And there was no unrighteousness in him. That means that he was perfect. He was qualified to go to the cross. There's no failure. So unlike Lucifer, Lucifer was doing his job. We don't know for how long, what the duration was, that he uh, functioned flawlessly, but he flawed somewhere. Not our Lord Jesus Christ. The distinction is appalling. All right, let me... Okay, you got Sur, you got Selah, and Selah is Christ in Resurrection. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> Christ is upright. This is what we see in Psalm ninety-two, fifteen. Unlike Satan, there is no unrighteousness in him. So you're able to compare and contrast. Right? When you compare, you're looking at things that are similar. When you contrast, you're looking at things that are dissimilar from one item to the next. He is my rock. This is salvation work of Christ. <clears throat> there is no unrighteousness in him. This is his post-salvation work. Okay, it's pre-salvation because he qualified to go to the cross. But in his post-salvation work, he is rewarded because of his uh, righteousness and that is reward is seen in his resurrection his ascension and his session so his pre-incarnate state Christ as God he was perfect there was no unrighteousness in him Christ as creator he created everything well and right there was no miscreation in the works of Christ. Number three, Christ was co-equal and co-eternal with the Trinity. There was no disparity. 
Christ was not the runt of the litter. And number four, Christ as the mediator between the Trinity and man, and this includes his being the Messiah. When Christ came to earth, he was the perfect mediator. What is it that it says in Timothy? For there was one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He was the perfect mediator. Nothing was lacking. His house was not sinking at one corner. His house didn't have a crack somewhere. His house, all the doors and the windows open. They aren't opening to the soil. <clears throat> His incarnate state. While he was here on earth, his incarnate state, his birth, it was prophesied, and the prophecy was fulfilled to the letter. His childhood was perfect, and there was some prophecy of his childhood, very little do we know about it, but we do know that as he was growing up, people made fun of him because his mother was a virgin and he became as it were the uh, butt of many jokes we are told that in Psalm 69 his baptism at his baptism there were there was the voice that came from heaven and it was the um, dove that lighted on him and the voice from heaven said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased in his incarnate state, he was perfect in every way. He was exemplary when it came to his temptations. He never failed, not even once. He was able to outfence Satan in those temptations. In his transfiguration, he was set forth with power. The transfiguration was such an amazing time and his disciples, the few that were able to go up there to see it, they saw Christ like they had never seen him before, and they had no idea that he was as great as he was. And here is the kicker, that this is before he was glorified in his hypostatic union. He's going to have even more glory when you and I see him. And the scripture says, and we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That means that you and I are going to be encrusted in glory. It is going to be just a fantastic thing. <clears throat> Number five, in his teaching, Matthew chapter 15, and we don't have time to go into the 15th chapter of Matthew, but it is replete with insights. Number six, in his mighty works, while he was on earth, he did many mighty works. Uh, one of those that we just studied in church on Sunday, the feeding of the, was it 6,000? 4,000? Five? <laughs> okay, I, I can't catch you guys. Number seven, his salutary work on the cross. When he was on the cross, he actually provided salvation for you and for me. It wasn't just a mere beneficial act on his part. It provided salvation for you and for me. His work on the cross. Christ is upright. He's got the integrity. He's got the righteousness. He is perfect in that regard. It is his burial, his resurrection, his ascension and session that prove that God accepted his work on the cross. When he was put into the tomb, the tomb was sealed so as to serve as the backdrop for the resurrection. It's kind of like when you go to the jewelry store, you want to buy a, uh, an expensive gem of some sort. They get this black velvet that they lay on a counter. And then they pour the jewels out there so that you can see them better. That's what his burial was. His burial provided the background for that. His resurrection, his ascension, and his session. There is no unrighteousness in him. 
And those are the three items which prove it beyond any doubt. But there's more to the, the uh, career of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is his post-resurrection state. <clears throat> he has the administration of the church and the church age. What does this mean? It means that when the Lord Jesus Christ is in charge of the church, the church functions perfectly. Does that mean that there will be no problems within the church? No, people will have problems. But the Lord's leadership will be perfect in every way. And the church age will be the same way. He handles both of these things. When you get to know Christ as your personal Savior, you first of all know Him as the Savior. Secondly, you get to know Him as the administrator of the church. So, uh, as the administrator of the church, it means that you look to Him and He is the one that does what He does. And He uses men, and that's the tricky thing in the administration of the church, that He uses men who are flawed, and yet they accomplish His will. And then last and, f and uh, foremost, he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when he comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he is going to do something that has never been done before and will never have to be done again. And that is that he is going to eradicate evil. The philosophy of Satan is going to be taken care of by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why, and when we're looking at the angelic conflict, as a Christian, as a believer, you are never commanded to rebuke Satan or to command a demon to come out of somebody. That job belongs to Jesus Christ. And it is not only foolishness on your part to do so because you're waking up the lion, but uh, you are blaspheming because you're telling Christ, hey, move over, I can do this job better than you can. Okay, in the administration of the church age, there is the rapture. The rapture is going to come when he comes. I know it sounds really weird. When we were kids, um, and I belonged to various camp groups, we always used to sing the song, We're here because we're here. Yeah. Because we're here because we're here. Yeah. When the rapture comes, it's going to come. Not because we hurry Christ, not because we pressure Christ, but he's going to come when the, the day is right. The Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, everything will be done correctly, righteously. He will be the judge. Nobody will be misjudged. Nobody will be cheated out of rewards. Nobody will be over-rewarded. The rewards are going to be exactly right because there is no unrighteousness in him. Then there's the administration of Israel. Israel right now is put in the back shelf. But one day it will be brought forward and um, when that takes place it's because the tribulation will be taking a hold on the earth. And the tribulation will end with his second coming. The second coming will signal the establishment of the Davidic kingdom, which we call the millennium. And so he is the one that does that. It will be done perfectly without any fail or flaw. And then the third thing, as far as his post-incarnate state, is the conclusion of his mediation. He will no longer have to stand before the Father and say, I died for Jesse Acosta because I'll be in eternity. My volition will be locked on positive. I will be stopped from sinning. I won't need his intercession anymore. So his mediation will stop because he will have brought me perfectly into his kingdom of light. And that is just like I can hardly wait to be perfect. 
1 Corinthians 15, 27 gives us some information along those lines of how he turns over the kingdom to the Lord. Revelation 11 and verse 15 gives us some information as well as to how that uh, happens. And uh, maybe we ought to just turn there before we close so that I don't just leave you hanging. Would you turn your Bibles to Revelation 15? I mean, Revelation 11, 15. Can't be that passage because my pages of my Bible are sticking. This is uh, one of the beautiful lines that comes out in Handel's Messiah. So let me just jump on verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, quote, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. It's going to be a fantastic day. It's going to be one horrendous party. I, I mean... There's not much more that you can say. He's going to reign forever and ever. It's the biggest inauguration party that you'll ever see. You are invited. You actually will have a front row seat, unlike the other peoples, uh, the saved peoples, that will have to be in, in, the, uh, in the wings of that auditorium. It's going to be just a wonderful time. So the conclusion of his mediation will take place then and we will go right into eternity. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is righteous in all of these things. In contrast to Satan or Lucifer in whom unrighteousness was found. Okay, I've got maybe one last thing to say. In the book of Philippians in chapter 2, we are told or we're given some information. Uh, it's an injunction, actually. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And uh, it says, even though he was in eternity, even though he was God, that he did not consider it robbery to come to this earth and to go through all the suffering and to go through all the rigmarole and at all that time, he had to watch his P's and Q's and be perfect. Lucifer, on the other hand, was in the lap of luxury. He had the place of prestige. He had the admiration of everybody in heaven. And yet, he was not able to hold it together. You can see how much greater our Lord Jesus Christ is. Okay, any questions?